just wanna check if you can hear me on the stream okay nice thank you so good afternoon and welcome to this session uh, we'll be talking about project fugu and how we can use it uh, to make our web applications more capable so quick intro i'm arnel i write code at new logic as a software dev i am also a gde for web technologies which gives me the chance to share about new web APIs and technologies to other developers through events like this. And I write about random web stuff on my site, so you can check it out. And so uh, you can also get a copy of these slides through this link. Uh, you can use the bit.ly link or you can scan this QR code. So let's give it, let's give you a few seconds to do that. <coughs> Okay, so uh, for this session, we'll be talking about the Web Capabilities Project, also known as Project FUBU. Uh, so Project FUBU uh, is an effort to make it possible for web applications to do, oops, I missed a word here, to do anything that native and desktop applications can do. Uh, this is like a cross-company effort, not just from Google, but also other browser vendors like Mozilla, Apple, Microsoft, etc., as other as well as other contributors to the web platform like Intel and other companies, and yeah, it just makes it possible for web apps to do ex to have extra capabilities that were previously only available to native and desktop applications, and at the same time, also preserve what the web really is, like the core benefits of the web, such as user security, privacy and how easy it is to share links to other people etc so that's like the core like mission of what project fugu is all about so project fugu is not like one technology one api that we use it's not like a library or something but it's like an umbrella term for a lot of web apis so we won't be talking a lot about project fugu here but we'll be talking about the individual individual apis that comprise what we call us like that builder the project fugu uh, umbrella so there's about five or six of them in this talk, so we'll just go through them one by one. And it's not there's not only six APIs in Project Fugu, there's a lot, but we don't have time for all of them. So I just pick ones that are that we can easily like there, that we can do we can add a small additions to our websites, but then greatly enhances the user experience already. So let's start with uh, the web share api so you've probably heard of this before you've probably used this before but yes um, web share api we categorize it under like project fugu uh let's uh let's imagine some of the sites that uh, we see today uh, it's pretty common to see um this what we call like social media social media buttons that allows us to share a web page through its url to other applications like uh, right um, usually like other social media platforms or through email or through like yeah reddit pinterest etc so so this is a uh, pretty common company and kind of unique to the web because um web pages you just need to share the link and it's shared um also compare that to how we do sharing on native mobile apps so for example you have um you have a file on your um on your camera roll for example or on your file explorer on your phone and you want to share it um imagine how it looks like in your phone it, um your your operating system your phone shows like a native share ui dialog that you can use to share that file through to other um, natively installed apps so that's like the difference between web and native and the web share api uh, tries to close that gap between web and native. So Web Share API allows web applications to share text, links, and other contents to other applications on the device. So share content, uh, content can be shared through a native share dialog that we already see and use um, natively on like native apps on our devices. So it looks like this, which you already know what it looks like. This is 
through uh, an, a web application like a web the web Twitter application or like a code pen site and it even works across platform this is what it looks like on Android and wait is this Android I think so no this is um, I think these are all Android and then the second one is probably on iOS and then it actually even works on Windows on desktop which as you can see on the third picture or screenshot so uh, the Windows support is pretty new so you can try it out if you want and yes this is what it looks like you already know what the share dialog looks like and it's the web share API is very simple to use uh, you, we just call navigator.share and pass in the information that we want to share so it accepts three by default I mean initially it accepts three properties so the title the text and the URL that you want to share so a title could be like the title of the document or the article that you want to share text could be like a small snippet or a small summary and your URL is like the link you want to share so all of these are required but one of them should be provided and yes initially web share api supports only text and links but a recent like amendment to the api also allows sharing files so in case you have a web application where you can create photos or draw things and you want to share that drawing to other applications then you can use the web share api to share that as a file to other native applications so again you still call navigator.share but then we now provide oops how do you enable the pointer wait let me enable the pointer no. uh, okay here so we still call the navigator.share but then now we provide a files array which is an array of file objects that we want to share so file objects we can generate it however we want depends on our app it could be a file uploaded by the user or it could be generated from a canvas or fetched from a web server it's all up to you so now yes you can share files uh web share api is not supported in all, in all browsers especially the open browsers so a common theme that you see in all of these project fugo apis that is also like good practice is to do feature detection and progressive enhancement that means um, you only use the api if it's supported by the browser and then provide a ba i mean you provide a baseline experience for uh, browsers that don't support the api yet but then progressively enhance them by enabling these new apis when they are supported by the browser so to feature detect or to detect if Navig web share api is supported on your browser on the browser that the user is using uh, you can check the press you can check if navigator.share is defined and only then you should call uh, navigator.share uh, so this works for feature detecting files i mean the text and urls but for feature detecting files uh, since it's a later addition uh, you can f there's a different way to feature detect it by checking navigator.canshare so if navigator that can share function is defined, then uh, sharing files is supported. But then you still need to check if you can share a specific kind of file, because uh, it could be that your device is only able to share image files, not PDFs or other kinds of files. So you have to also call navigator that can share, and then provide the files that you want to share. So it will check if it's your your device is able to share this file format. And only then you should call navigator.share and then pass your files here. And again, take note, you only do this if you want to share files. If you just want to share text and URLs, then this simple check should be enough. So web share API, browser support, it's pretty good um, for Chrome and Safari at least. Uh, so yeah, these are the browsers where they are supported and these are the browsers where sharing files is supported. So right now i think we are in chrome 91 so it's yeah it's been supported for a while and yes so that's web share uh, web share in summary allows a web application to share content to other native um uh, other native applications you have the facebook app installed the twitter app installed you can share to them to those apps directly but what if you want to share 
content into your web application. So let's say you're using the Facebook app, you're using like your file explorer, you see a file and you want to share that file into your web application. So it's like the other way around. And to do that, we, call, we used another Project Fugo API called the Web Share Target API. So let's take a look at the native share dialog again. Uh, so this is what it looks like. Uh, web Share Target API allows us to add our web application into the choices here in the sh Web Share dialog. So, so if you have this tweet, uh, we could probably share it into whatever web app you want here. So that's what uh, the Web Share Target API is for. So um, to use the Web Share Target API, uh, there are a few steps you need to do. Uh, first, we need to register our application as a web target. And this is only possible if our web application is, in, is added to the home screen. And to make application added to the home screen, it needs to like PWA, um, features like the web application manifest so that um, the browser will prompt the user to install it, etc. But PWA is uh, beyond what the topic that we're going to talk about today, but uh, it basically allows you to, um, one of the things that PWS allows you to do is to create web applications that can be added to the home screen as if they were native apps. So yes, this is uh, the requirement to use the WebShare API, your PWA needs to be added to the home screen. And yes, these are some Chrome instability cri installability criteria, like it should have a service worker, a, a, a web app manifest. Um, the user should have like um, visited your site several times, I think. Uh, this changes a lot, all the time, so just Google it later if you want, but yes. But essentially, your app needs to be added to the home screen. And once your application is added to the home screen, uh, we need to define your, app, your, your application as a shared target by, by adding additional information in our web applications. So uh, if you're unfamiliar, uh, the web application manifest in, Peter, in progressive web apps uh, defines some metadata about your app, like what What's the name of your app? What logo to use when it's added to the home screen? Um, which page to open when the user taps on your icon on the home screen? So things like that are all defined in the web application manifest. And in the web application manifest, we can just add this additional information to make our web application a shared target. So it's called shared target, and we define some keys. So action, this is like the page in your app that will be opened when someone shares something to your app. So if I share an, an, uh, if I share a link to this progressive web app, then it will open the app and then go to slash share uh, URL and then display that page. So method is get, so it will display that page. And then these are the URL params. Uh, basically, these are the um, web share API parameters that we're expecting. So if you remember, remember from the previous API, web share API, we can pass the title title right, right when we call web share navigator that share. So these are those parameters. And these uh, get added to the URL when the page is open. So it will look something like this. So when someone, when a user shares a content like URL, text, whatever, from another app into your progressive web app that's using the web share target API, uh, it will you open this page slash share, and then the params here, title, text, URL, uh, they get defined as query string parameters in the URL. So you see here text and URL, and yeah, I didn't add a title, but yes. And you need to handle these parameters in your code already. So in the, sh in the slash share page, uh, what, however you define this, I should have some JavaScript there that will get these values. So you can get that th through the URL um, object and then get the search params that get title, text, URL, uh, depending on which ones of these uh, we are going to use. So some applications might only just use URL or just text. Uh, it depends on your application, but that's how you get it. So here we're only handling text and links, but we can also support 
um, files being shared to our application and with, with just some modifications in our web application manifest. So action still the same, which URL will the request be sent to, but this time it needs to be a post request because you're sending a file. So, and then you need to provide the encoding type. Uh, this is similar to like, if you're defining an HTML form, this is, these are the same attributes that you would put in your HTML form. And again, the params are the same. You have text. Uh, we don't, in this example, let's say we didn't need the URL or the title. So we're not adding them here. So we only need the text and the files. So files is like an array of like what file formats we are expecting and what what to name them. Basically, when it gets recorded for our um, URL. So here, images should only accept like image and I mean PNG files. So we can define accept here as like a MIME type or a file extension. Um, it's recommended to provide both because um, different browsers might support like either one of these. So safer to provide both to like have the broadest support. And yes, you can support multiple files here. For example, we can have a different um, name for, for example, when sharing PDF files. So we can probably have like a name documents then accept PDF files. So you can define that depending on your app. But yes, in this example, we're only accepting PNG images and a text. And then this gets, so unlike like method get, which displays the page and method post, the request will get submitted to this URL um, directly. And then it's up to the application to like redirect somewhere or display another page um, that you want the user to see. Or, or you can also handle this in your service provider if you want, but all up to you. Um, yes, so additional recommendations for um, using WebShare Target API. Uh, since you're already probably building a, web, a progressive web app for this, uh, which is already added to the home screen, um, it's recommended to pre-cache the action page. So the action page is the page you define in the action property so that it loads quickly and works reliably. So even though you're offline, you can still see the shared page, and then you can just submit it later when the user gets connected to the internet again. So pre-cache the action page so that it's available offline and loads quickly. And then verify the incoming shared data. So for example, here we are, we define in our web application manifest, right, that we expect title text URL. We get this here in our JS, the title text URL, but um, when someone calls like navigator that share um, in their app, like another app, not yours, and then they only provide title, not the text and URL. So you will have no values for text and URL here. So, so that's why it's important to verify. Um, if the information you receive are enough, so you might, you might be able to like, for example, you, you just want your app will still work even though you get text. And then if URL is not provided, maybe you can try to look for the URL in the text. Or if title is provided, then use the text as a title. So that depends on your app. But um, important is um, verify the incoming shared data because different apps can call the share API and pass different information. So make sure that whatever they pass, your app will still work. And browser support, yeah, for now it's still on Chrome and Edge on Android and Chrome OS. Um, yeah. So third API, so async clipboard. Uh, what's the async clipboard about? Uh, so we use this for copying things to the user's clipboard. So um, traditionally, we, we, we are able to achieve that using the document.exec command function. So you can call like document, document that exec. Uh, first, you have to hide that you want to copy automatically, so you can maybe put that in an input type text, focus that element, and then call document that text a command copy. So that's like the equivalent of like programmatically doing control C, and then you can again call document that text a command paste to paste it somewhere. So um, it works, uh, but it could be better. So uh, async clipboard API is like an API that allows 
web apps to programmatically write to and read from the clipboard. So reading and writing is done asynchronously, so it doesn't block the JavaScript thread. And um, yeah, it supports other formats also, not just text, but you can read and write other formats into the clipboard as we will see in a few slides. So writing to the clipboard is easy or like copying or doing control C <laughs> to the clipboard is easy. Uh, just define the string that you want to copy. Uh, here I'm just hard coding it to hello clipboard, but you can get the string from wherever you want. Could be like a response from the API or something that the user typed. And then you just call navigator.clipboard.writeText, text. And then the text that, is that you want to add to the clipboard. Uh, and your text is now in the clipboard. Uh, but again, as I mentioned, uh, it also supports other formats, not just text. Uh, in fact, we can copy images and HTML into the clipboard. So for now, I think only PNG images are supported, but in the future, other images will definitely be supported. And then recently, there's also no support for copying HTML like MIME type into the clipboard. So we'll see how that works. So here we have an Im the image that we want to copy to the clipboard as a blob object. So creating a blob, again, there are many ways to do it. It could be like something that the user um, uploaded through an input file, an in input type file input, and then you convert into a blob. Uh, the image could be coming from your API or like an online service. You fetch it using the fetch API and then you read the result as a blob. Or you can also draw an image to a canvas and then read the canvas data as a blob. So as long as you get a blob at the end, which represents a PNG image, that's fine. And then once you have that image, uh, we create an item. The item. report item represents an item in the clipboard. Yeah. Very obvious. And you provide here like the MIME types and the blob that you want to copy. So here um, we provide image PNG and this, this is the image PNG blob object that we want to copy. And yes, now we have an item which is a clipboard item. All we need to do is call navigator.clipboard.write and then the clipboard item that we want to write the clipboard. And once this runs, our image is now copied to the clipboard. Um, the user can then paste that image in any other app that they want by just doing like control V, command V, the image will be pasted directly wherever they want. So that's how writing to the clipboard works or copying things to the clipboard works. Let's take a look at how we get items from the clipboard or like read data from the clipboard. So let's start with text. Um, reading text, text, text from the clipboard is very straightforward. You just call navigator word that word that text and then it will get like the latest clipboard item as a text or in text format. So here we get hello clipboard. I'm assuming we do, we run this code which apparently I missed the exclamation point. Um, so that's how we read text, very straightforward. And to read other formats from the clipboard, um, it's also very straightforward. We just call navigator.clipboard.read. And here we get an items, which is supposedly an array of clipboard items. Uh, yes, it's, it's still an array of clipboard items. Um, I think it's designed this way to return an array of clipboard items. Um, to support maybe in the future, like you can read multiple clipboard items at once. But uh, so yes, this is an array, but in practice, this array only has one item for now. It might change in the future, but here we're looping, but there's really just one item here. But maybe in the future, we'll get more items here, depending on the platform. Or, I don't know. Uh, but yeah, as I said, there's a time but we still loop through it. Um, so we loop through all items from the clipboard and then we can get the blob representation of that clipboard item by calling item.getType. So the type that we provide here, which is image slash PNG, should correspond to whatever um, type that we also provide when that uh, image, I mean, when that, 
item was added to the Flipboard. So here we're expecting an image. So we just call like item that get type image slash png, and then we get the image as a blob object. Now you can do whatever you want with that. You can display that on the page or send that to your API. Um, yeah. So this is actually also so maybe in case. So here I'm just showing an example of using image that png, but uh, as I mentioned, HTML types like text slash html is also supported so you may have noticed that in practice when you copy your code from vs code, VS code and then paste that in google instance and then you will notice that when you paste it it will copy or it will maintain or preserve the syntax highlighting the font everything that you originally had from vs code into google slides in fact that's how i made my slides i wrote my code samples in VS Code, copy it, paste it in Google Slides, and then I get all my syntax highlighting. So that's what um, async clipboard API can do. Um, because when you copy, let's so I don't know if this is how VS Code or Google Google Slides does it, but it's definitely a, it's one use case for async clipboard API. So when we say when we copy from VS Code, for example, VS Code could do something like create a new clipboard item, um, provide text slash HTML here, which is the HTML representation of your code with all the syntax highlighting and everything. Then that gets written to the clipboard. And then when you paste it in um, Google Slides, Google Slides could do something like this, where it will read the clipboard item and then get the HTML type a representation to the page so that's how uh, that's yeah that's one use case and yeah more types will be added um, in the future for now we support png and html so one important thing with um, async clipboard api and other fugu apis as well is they always try to we always maintain um, the user's privacy and security so um, you don't want a random website that you visit to like secretly read whatever is in your clipboard, right? For example, you're using your password manager, you copy your password, and then behind the scenes, a website just reads whatever is in your clipboard. So that's that's not good. So um, there's um, different things in place with um, async clipboard API and other APIs uh, that uh, always makes it like transparent to the user what's happening on your browser. So first here at the bottom, um, when a when a when a website tries to read that item from the clipboard, uh, it will always ask for permission from the user if they want to allow the site to read content of your clipboard or not. Uh, that way, the user is aware and they can think, okay, what's in my clipboard, and before they allow or they can block it. And writing to the clipboard. And the current page that is doing the write must be um, the currently focused um, page or tab because yeah, you don't want um, a random website to like just write something in your clipboard while you are typing um, whatever on another a separate app. And then when you click paste, uh, you get a random clipboard item that was written, written by a random site behind the scenes. So um, when writing text or when writing any data to the clipboard, um, the current tab should be the active or like the focus tab. So feature detection, again, it's also straightforward. We just check um, navigator that if navigator.clipboard is defined, that way we know that clipboard async clipboard API is supported and we can safely call these functions. Um, otherwise, otherwise we can find back to the and yes, additional recommendations for using the async clipboard API, uh, which is here. Uh, notice here we're just getting item that get type directly, uh, but recommended. Uh, check first what are the available formats um, for that clipboard item, so you can get that by clip by. Um, accessing clipboard item that types, which will give you like an array of the different formats supported by that clipboard item. And second one, when you are writing data to the clipboard, 
um, if you can um, include a text version of it in the same clipboard item. So it will look something like this. So here we have an image slash PNG, which is the image file. And then we can also add another key value pair here, which says like text slash plain, and then some text version. It could be like a string describing that image. Um, that way, um, applications that don't support like pasting images into just get the text version. Uh, yes. Okay, so that's it for async clipboard. Browser support is pretty good on Chrome, um, Edge, Firefox, Safari. So, yep. And API, Project Fugu API number four. Uh, media session API. Um, so, Media session API allows applications to customize the media notifications and playback controls. Uh, yeah, you're, I'm sure you've seen this before. So, um, in, 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 it also works like across different browsers, across different platforms. So in Chrome, um, we have this media hub on the, beside the Omnibox, beside your profile drop down that displays what's currently playing, like the artwork, the title, like some control buttons. Um, this works for Chrome and also even on Windows like the native Windows uh, Media Hub, it's it also displays there. On mobile devices, uh, it will be displayed as a media notification like this, where you can see what's, see what's playing and like stick or it. even on like sync um, wearable devices it works. So you can customize different parts of this uh, media notification using the media session session API. So you can customize the title the title, the artist or album, and the artwork, which is this one. And you can also customize what buttons or like action buttons um, you want to be displayed in the notification. And the position state is like this, the seeking part of your media. So that can be controlled as well. So how to use it? Uh, it's very easy. You just create, you just assign a metadata object into navigator that media session that metadata and in this metadata object you define the title artist album whatever information you want to display the artworks uh, which is yeah the image that gets displayed in that notification and just this there's no even there's not even a function called just create a new object and then assign it uh, you are able to customize the media notification so yeah, so these are the metadata. Uh, how, what about the um, control buttons? How do we define what should happen when the user clicks play or pause or seek forward or like next song or something? Uh, we can do that by customizing the playback controls by calling navigator that media session that set action handler. So by default, uh, if you don't define an action handler for an action, in this case, the action is play, the, that button will not be displayed. So if you don't set an action handler for play, then the play button won't be displayed in the notification. Same with like next, previous, seek forward, etc. So here, it's just like, it's like, just like defining an event handler in JavaScript, uh, although the function name is different. So it's navigator that media session that set action handler, the action that you want to handle, which could be play, pause, etc., and then the function that you want to do whenever that ac action is performed. So you can, you can manually like play, pause, or play in that case. So these are all um, the actions that are supported. Uh, we can play, pause, previous track, next track, stop, seek forward, seek backward, seek to is when you manually drag the um, progress bar of your media. And then this, this last three ones specific to um, desktop devices, I think that supports picture in picture. So you can also toggle the microphone, camera, and like end that call. Uh, these are like the video conferencing specific um, actions. So if you have, actually, I forgot to add a screenshot of that, but let's just say, let's say the session. Okay. Okay, here. Um, 
just a quick screenshot for video conferencing once it will look something like this um, so you can when when you have a call like for example in Google Meet or whatever and um, you display that video you display a video as a picture in picture window uh, um, which you can drag around it's always we can define the action buttons to toggle your mic toggle your camera or hang up the call that's what it looks like so about the others, uh, they work for like media stuff, like this one. So play next, etc. So I get you get. I think you get the idea already. So next, so how to set the position state? So the position state is like the progress bar in your media notification. So that way you can see like you're already halfway in the song or halfway or, or at the end of the video already. So you can define the duration, the position, or like the current time in that media that you're playing and like the playback rate. And then, then the API will keep track of it as it progresses already. And feature detection. Yeah, there are two things that you can feature detect. Um, first is support for media session API itself. Um, again, similar to the others, navigator that media session uh, make sure that that's defined before setting the metadata or calling the action or calling settings like action handler. And if you want to use position state, since also, also a, a later addition to the API, uh, you have to check for you have to check if that function is defined first before you call it. So your feature detection code would so would look something like this. Maybe not the second if if you're not using it. And additional notes. Uh, so you remember how you set a metadata for the media that you're playing. Uh, make sure that um, when the media changes, like when you play the next song, that you update. Uh, remember to update the metadata. Otherwise, uh, it will it will still uh, you, the next media, the next song, for example, will still play, but the metadata will still be for the previous song. So make sure that whenever the source of the media that you're playing changes to update the metadata as well. Otherwise, it will be so confusing why you're displaying different song and then it's playing a different thing. Um, so you can also unset uh, media session property by setting it to null. So if you want to clear the uh, metadata and just default to, and just fall back to like the default thing that could display, then just set it null. Or if you want to unset like an action handler, uh, just set action handler to null. And yeah, so setting metadata, additional note also here that um, I'll just say is um, you don't have to clear the metadata when the media stops playing. It will, Chrome will, or like the browser will automatically like hide it for you. So you don't have to do it yourself. And browser support, again, pretty good. Chrome 73 and 57 on Android, Edge, Firefox, Safari. Um, media session also even displays on like the now playing um, widget on, on Mac OS, which is cool. So yeah, that's it. Project Fugu API number five. So we're near the end already. So, so that we don't go over time. So we've got the API. Very simple API um, program allows us or web applications to programmatically obtain an OTP from our SMS messages. So OTP is a very important like part of some processes when we use for applications relations, right? This could be like the first time or like second factor authentication. So currently the flow is uh, try to log in. It will send you an OTP via SMS, for example. Then you close the browser to go to your messages app to copy or like memorize the six digit OTP, go back to the browser, type it. And some, depending on the device, you might see the notification appear. So you can just read quickly from there before it disappears and then type your OTP. So that's like very stressful and okay, a lot of switching apps. So uh, actually, it's not very stressful, but again, it could be better. Um, WebOTP tries to um, improve that by reducing the friction that the users have when they want to verify their phone numbers through SMS OTPs. 
So it looks like this. Um, on Android, um, when you receive an OTP, you can, yeah, some devices on Android also allow ask you, I mean, allows you to copy the OTP directly. But with web OTP, um, the browser will just display a sheet at the bottom of them, and then you just click verify the OTP into uh, the, the OTP input field. So just click here. Um, again, this is another um, security feature. Um, the browser won't just give the SMS content to the web application right away. Uh, it always asks the users to confirm um, everything. And on iOS, it looks something like this. Um, the OTP will be suggested um, in the keyboard and then press it to input it. Um, we'll see later w um, how it works specifically on iOS because iOS doesn't actually support it. So um, how do we use the Web OTP API? So Web OTP API is built on top of an, early AP an earlier API called the Credentials Management API. So Credential Management API allows you to like save Add other forms of credentials like email and password, etc., to the browser's um, password manager or like credential manager. So if you've used that before, then the API will look familiar. But OTP is just uh, just an addition to that. So that's why we will see a usage um, to get the OTP. We call navigator that credentials, which is the credentials management API, and then that get to get a credential. But here we specify that we want to get an OTP credential. So this is the web OTP part already. And then transport SMS uh, should be coming from an SMS message. Um, this call will give you once the message has arrived, once the API has received, um, once the user has like clicked on the verify button, uh, the, the OTP will be provide will be sent back as a response in this OTP like variable. And it will look something like this. Uh, it will be an instance of the OTP credential class uh, with properties code and type. Code will be like the OTP already. And then type is OTP. It will always be OTP. Um, then you can just, in your JS code, you can just use this value and set it as the value of the OTP input field. And for cross-browser compatibility, because uh, this is what I meant earlier, um, iOS doesn't actually support the JavaScript API for web OTP, OTP but um, we work on the, uh, we, the, the input field that we use for OTP, we annotate it with the autocomplete equals one time code attribute. And that way Safari will automatically know that uh, when you receive an OTP, this is where you want to input it. And when you click on the suggestion on the keyboard, uh, this is where uh, it will be added. So yep. Um, so after you, after uh, you you get the OTP credential and you haven't received it yet, let's say it takes a lo a while for the SMS to arrive. Maybe the SMS sending like service didn't work or other reasons, and then the user became impatient and then navigated to another page because they don't want to log in anymore. Um, you can abort the uh, navigator that credentials that get call. Um, it's important to abort it. Otherwise, you don't want the verify sheet at the bottom to appear, even though it's not relevant to the current page anymore. So this is usually, it's usually done when like the user navigates on the page, you see the OTP input field anymore. So remember to abort the OTP request, like the the request the the function call to get the OTP. Uh, this is done by using the abort controller API, as you see here. So abort controller, uh, modern APIs use this to cancel them. So you probably have used this before to cancel um, Ajax request perform using the fetch API. So similarly, this you use it exactly the same way when you want to abort the web OTP API. I mean, you, the web OTP request. So first, you create an instance of abort controller. Let's call it controller. And then here, we still see the same call to navigator that credentials that get OTP transport SMS, exactly the same. But now we add an extra property, which is signal colon 
the controller that signal property from the abort controller. So later on, when we want to abort the request, let's say the user navigated to another page, um, let's ju we just call controller that abort, and then the API call will be cancelled already. So yeah. bonus API abort controller. So that's how you cancel a web OTP request. And so that's so that's so what we've talked about so far is just the JavaScript API parts. Uh, there's also actually a very another second part which is also very important, which is the format of the SMS message, so that uh, web OTP can detect that we, you received the OTP SMS message already. So format is like this. Um, this first part could be anything you want, uh, just some information that you want to say to the user. You can say you can say any message here, like here's your OTP colon one three four five six. Uh, the important part is really the last line of your message, and this should always be the last line of your message. So if there's an extra character here at the end, then this is already an invalid format. So the last line of your message should contain an at. I mean, the last line should start with an at symbol, and then the domain of your site. And this is how the browser knows like to which page they will send the OTP to. Uh, and separate the space and then hashtag the OTP code. So this should look exactly like this in order for the Web OTP API to pick it up. Oops. So yeah, just to summarize, j use the JS API and then format the SMS message properly. So feature detection, um, again, if it's not supported, then we can't use it. We have to ask the user to manually type in the OTP. But if it is supported, it's a good like progressive enhancement. Um, it allows the user to like verify faster with just like one tap of a button. So to detect if um, Web OTP is supported, uh, we just check if the OTP credential class is defined in window before we call navigator that credentials that get. So pretty simple. And additional recommendations. Yeah, so verify that the OTP is a valid one, so you can check uh, maybe if the format of the OTP is um, correct. If you're expecting um, five digits but you got six, then it's invalid. And other, and secondly, uh, degrade gracefully when an invalid OTP is received. So I think this is pretty common when implementing OTPs already. You can tell them, you can tell the user that. Um, Invalid OTP, please try again, or like resend the OTP, uh, etc. Depends on your app. And browser support for now so works on Android. I mean, Android Chrome on Android. And Safari, although take note, um, the JS API in Safari is not supported yet. So you have to use the autocomplete one time code um, input proper attribute. So last but not the least. So I think. Yep, yep, last. So this is the last um, project for Google API that we'll talk about, which is shape detection API. So, okay. So description of the shape detection API, it allows web applications to detect barcodes, faces, and text from images. So pretty useful these days, right? Especially with like the lockdowns and like the contact tracing stuff. You have to scan a lot of QR codes in like different establishments that you enter. You enter. So if you're building of that, you can enter using the Shape Detection API. Um, so Shape Detection API doesn't actually implement barcode detection, face detection, and text detection. Uh, in fact, those detectors, those feature detectors, are already supported by your device or your operating system. So that could be the same um, detector uh, that could be the same detector that when you open your native camera app and then you scan a QR code, it will automatically detect the QR code, right? And then you can open the new browser tab. So that could be the underlying um, implementation for it. Uh, Shape Detection API only exposes those um, already supported detectors into the web through several JavaScript APIs. So this is an example. So let's take a look. So there are three detectors here. 
um, barcode detector, face detector, text detector, and just take a look at barcode detection. Um, how you use the other two are exactly the same. So to use barcode detector, you just create, we just create a new barcode detector object. Uh, we can what formats we are expecting. So a lot of barcode formats out there, you can narrow it down to the ones that you specifically need. Or you can just read all the formats by just um, removing this option. So now we got a detector. And we just call detector that detect. And passing in the image that we want to detect uh, barcodes from. So this image could be um, any image on the web. So canvas image source, uh, it means it could be like an image element or a video element or a canvas element. Blob, yeah, we've talked about blobs before. You can get this from anywhere, from a canvas, from uh, an HTTP API, from a, fa a file uploaded by the user. Um, image data is, yeah, that's still coming from the canvas. So the point is you pass an image here in whatever format convenient to you. So detector that detect the image, and then it will return a list of barcodes that it was able to find from that image. So this will be an array. So let's just take a look at each item in that array will be a detected barcode object. So it, so it has several properties. So what value the, the value of that barcode already? So if you have a URL that you encode into a QR code, this will be raw value here will be the URL already. Type, uh, it's the barcode type that is able to detect. So we'll see different types in a bit. Uh, bounding box just shows like the area on the image where it was able to find that barcode. And corner points um, describes, uh, like corresponds to like the four corners of that barcode. So it could be if it's, if it's a QR code, then one item in the corner points will be the X and Y coordinates of the top left corner, the X and Y coordinate of like the top right corner, and then etc. So you can use it in your UI to draw, like, to highlight the area in the image where you found the barcode from. And yes, there are a lot of barcode formats. Uh, supported formats depends on the device again. So you can check all the available formats on the device by running um, barcode detector that gets supported formats. formats. So, um, so I ran exactly on, uh, on, uh, on Chrome, on Mac, and these are all the supported formats that I have. So Aztec, like, I don't even know, like, most of it, I only know, like, QR code and PDF 417 and Aztec. But yes, these are all the supported formats that my device can, can detect and therefore can be detected by the uh, barcode detector, detector um, API if I run it on my device. So this could be different if I call this exact same function on my phone or like on an Android device or on Windows. So uh, make sure that you check first if your expected format is support supported. So speaking of that, um, let's talk about feature detection. So feature detection, um, it's not enough to just check if barcode detector is support is, is defined in window because as, as, as we saw in the previous slide, barcode detector could be supported, but we don't exactly support the specific QR code format that we want. So for example, I want to scan QR codes. Um, first, I need to detect if barcode detector is supported. And then once it's supported, I make sure that supported formats, which is this function call, includes the specific QR, I mean the specific barcode format that I want, which is QR code. So if it is, then that's when I start scanning. So additional recommendations, um, yeah, check out face detector and text detector. Uh, we'll, we'll not cover it here in the interest of time. And again, uh, just to note it again one more time, uh, not all platforms support all the different features because, as I said, the ship detection API only exposes whatever, whatever is already supported by your platform. So make sure to check specifically for the ones you want as we are doing here. And browser support, Chrome 83 for now on desktop and Android. And barcode detector is already enabled by default, so you can do it. I mean, you can use it directly if you want. And for now, face detector and text detector are behind a flag, so go to Chrome 
Chrome, Fallen Flags. And you have to enable like experimental mental web platforms and web platform features to be enable face detector and um, text detector. So in fact, I uh, will take a look at, at, because this is the last one already, so we have time to take a look at the demo. So this is like the shape detection demo, hopefully it works. Okay, it's not able to get my camera because it's being used by StreamYard, so let's try if this works. Oh no, it's not working. Okay, anyway, you can just check this link later on your device. Um, well, but basically that will show um, shape detection, like barcode, face, and um, text detection in action. So to summarize, uh, these are all the Project Fubu APIs that we talked about. WebShare, WebShare Target, Async Clipboard, Media Session, WebOTP, Shape Detection. Um, they're not really like very like complicated APIs to use. And just simple, like one function call um, to uh, to improve the experience of our sites already. Especially on WebOTP. Um, uh, media Session just makes your media get displayed nicely. But yes, this is what we talk about today, but there's actually a lot of other Project Fugu APIs out there that are very interesting. So ambient light sensor, for example, allows you to detect like how bright your environment is. So for example, here I'm in our living room. It's actually very dark. I just have a light. So I'm, my ambient light sensor might detect like I'm in low light condition. So it will give you a value then you can um, do whatever you want with that already. You can maybe, for example, uh, I, what I've done with this before is in my website, I have light mode and dark mode, which I automatically switch between depending on how, how bright my environment is. So if I'm in the dark room, then my site's dark mode automatically enables, so something like that. Um, screen wake clock uh, just prevents your display from sleeping. Uh, it works behind the scene. Um, it's useful if you're building apps that are go going to be displayed for kiosks, for, exa for example. So they can always be displayed there where maybe no one thing with it. You don't want the display to like sleep or like to lock. So screen wake lock works for that. Uh, file system access allows web applications to access the user's file system. So currently, that's not really not possible on the web. You have to upload the file, and then you have to download the file again if once after it's updated. File system um, grants access to like a specific directory, and then it can once the of course with security in mind. So the user needs to like like confirm everything that they want to give access. They have to select the folder, but once that is granted, um, file system access API can read and write content into that directory only. And web Bluetooth, Web NFC, Web HID, Web HID interacts with like other more complicated devices. So Web Bluetooth, uh, what I've done with this before is I had like a Bluetooth drone. I mean a drone that's controlled with Bluetooth, so you can fly it with Web Bluetooth API from your browser. Web NFC, Web HID, I've never used them before, but they're complicated and many more. So there's so much more Project Fugu APIs. Um, in fact, there's a Fugu Tracker website that. I use a lot, a lot to check like what's your food. So you can browse there. So let's take a quick look. So these are all the Project Fugu um, APIs. Oh, Chrome 92 is now stable as of four days ago. So I'm a bit outdated on what I said earlier. So these are the um, Fugu APIs that are already shipped. So there's a lot. Um, Contacts API allows web applications to pick someone from your contacts. Um, other stuff here that I don't see myself using ever, but also very useful for very specific um, use cases. Um, there's also a section about um, origin trials, which are already, they already have an implementation, but you need to join the origin trial in order to enable the API um, for your site. So I guess just click on details here if you want to know how that works. So there's actually a very cool one that's called Handwriting Recognition API, but I think it only works on Chrome OS, so I was excited when I saw this, but I couldn't use it. Um, developer trial, these are the ones behind like a flag, so again, Chrome flags to enable the, flag, the flags. Um, 
yeah, implant life sensor is still on developer trial. So started, these are the ones I think that they've already started implementing, but nothing that we can test yet. So under considerations, um, yeah, they are still considering it. And there's a lot. So if there's a specific um, project Fugu API that we really want to exist on the web, uh, you can actually help make that happen by starring and commenting on the bug. So how this works is, for example, I really want, okay, see, as I mentioned earlier, PDF might come at some point. So if you really want PDF support to arrive in async clipboard, uh, just go to the tracking bug here, click it. Uh, this will redirect you to the Chromium bugs tracker and then just start that issue um, it will help them with like how they prioritize what to implement and also um, comment are uh, not very necessary but if you have a specific use case why you need this api comment your use case so that they can also also consider that in the implementation and with that, i guess this is the last slide thank you for um, listening to this talk and again here's the qr code for the slides, you can scan this with a shape detector API if you want. Actually, I didn't try that. I'm not sure if that will work. And yes, I hope you learned something about Project Fugu. And if you have any questions, you can ask them during the Q&A. Thanks. Good afternoon. I am Hannah, the host for today, and I will be asking you some questions, which is um, coming from our live speakers. Um, um, thank you so much for your talk about the web um, using Project Google. So our first question is, what does Project Google brings to web developers? Uh, yes, very maybe broad question, but also very good question. Um, for web developers, it actually opens up a lot of possibilities for web applications. So just imagine being able to fly a drone with a web application. That's like something that's never possible before. Um, there's also APIs that interacts with like micro, micro, microcontrollers or devices that you plug via USB. So again, remember the goal. Remember the goal of like Project Fugu, which is to allow web to give ability. To, to, uh, to give capabilities that were only possible for native applications into the web. That's so much, there's so many possibilities um, in there. So what it gives to you, it depends on what kinds of applications you're building also. Uh, if you're, if uh, normally we build like web applications, like that host content, then there's also things we can do from there. Like web share allows you to share content directly to native apps without any extra documentation on the web show. So again, it opens a lot of new possibilities that were never possible before. Yes, I also remember what you said earlier for that Project Fugu is an effort to make possible for web apps to do anything that native and desktop apps can do. And they are not very complicated yep. to use. So let's proceed to our next question. Is Project Fugu similar with PWA or is it an upgrade? Okay, so Project Fugu, so PWAs, they are different, but they can work together. So because they have different goals, so progressive web apps allows your web applications to behave like native applications, right? That means like they work offline, even though you don't have internet connection, uh, they can get added to the home screen. So that's like a good start already, but there's still limitations with progressive web apps in terms of capabilities. For example, even though you have a progressive web app that was added to the home screen, it's still, it's for example, it still can't access all your files. So native applications, native Android applications can access like all your files. I guess I think I've never been an Android app, but that's like a 
functions. So um, PWAs, they make your web apps behave like native apps in terms of like how the user interacts with it, like from the home screen, through push notifications, through background sync, etc. But it's limited in terms of capabilities. Project Fugu adds those capabilities into your progressive web apps. Um, so in, if you have a progressive web app that's like a file browser, for example, how will you build that with, a, with like regular JavaScript, right? So Project Fugu with like the file system access API, for example, you can read your files, whichever directory you want. Actually, not just all directories. There are some restrictions, but just read the docs later. Uh, but again, Project Fugu adds more capabilities to progressive web apps, but it's also not limited to progressive web apps. Uh, Project, Project Fugu can be used even though you're, you don't have a progressive web app. So you just have a regular web application that you access, which requires internet connection, and like you access directly from your browser. Uh, Project Fugu still works with those um, applications. So they are different, but they work well, very well together. All right, so Project Google is different with PWA. All right, let's proceed to our next question. Could Project Google replace other app development frameworks? Um, it's okay. So app development frameworks, I'm just, I'm just going to assume that it's referring to what do you, what, what's up the development of frameworks referring to? Uh, could it be referring to like things like Cordova or Capacitor, things like that? I'm not sure, uh, but I'll just assume that that's what you meant. Um, I don't, I think it's more, so I think this question is more of like, are web applications going to replace like um, native applications? Because Project Fugu requires a web application also. And then app development frameworks like Cordova, Capacitor, um, they are written and like they are written using web applications, but then they output like native applications like an APK or like something you can distribute to the Play Store or like App Store. Um, I think it maybe it really won't replace replace it, but web applications to do things that you can only previously do with app development frameworks. Uh, so, uh, okay, let me be uh, like an example. Um, the reason why you're using app development frameworks is to use a specific API that accesses your files, for example, and then you have no choice but to install a native app because you can't access your file system otherwise. But with Project Fugu, that will become possible on the web then maybe you don't have a reason to use app development frameworks anymore. But again, that's um, case by case basis. Um, you know your reasons why you use app development frameworks. So um, maybe, yeah, I would say it's a case by case basis, but the end, Project Fugu adds more capabilities to the web. So um, some of those reasons might not make sense anymore if it's possi possible on the web. So it's, it depends. <laughs> So it depends, all right. So we have our two last questions. So for the second to the last, what are the common issues of Project Fugu? So, uh, uh, very common. Okay, it's not okay. it's an issue with the APIs now, but a common like problem that's really needs to be solved while implementing Project Fugu APIs. It's like that's how secure the API is. So um, in the web, the web is like built around like security. So like your web applications can't just access your files and everything. So it's more of like a sandbox environment. And Project Fugu, while implementing like APIs in Project Fugu, um, all of those things needs to be considered. Um, so for, um, and like you will see like in the, in the specs and like all the documentation, there's really a section on how they make, how they consider all these different, how do they consider these different APIs and like what are the possible like attack vectors that where this API can be used to like compromise the user security, privacy, and how they address that in that API. So I guess a common, I mean, I'll just interpret the question as like common problems that needs to be solved with Project Fogo is really around um, keeping the user security and privacy, even though uh, um, we make 
helpful guy. And in terms of maybe issues with the APIs themselves, uh, right now, common one would be like browser support. Um, not Again, that's common with um, any new web APIs. Not all browsers will support a certain API at once, once it gets implemented. So that's where um, feature detection and progressive enhancement um, comes into play, um, provide a good fallback, and then enhance the experience once the, once the API is supported. All right, so more on security and implementing things are need to be considered. So for our last question, Paul, which project Google APIs have the best chance of becoming a standard that can be adapted by web developers? Um, I So the project Google APIs, all of them are like in the process of being standardized eventually. Um, I think better answer to that question would be to check the Fugu tracker. Um, there's going to be, let me see. Um, so for example, web Bluetooth API, API. I, I, I think even some project APIs are really like standardized already. So let's say web project Bluetooth, web Bluetooth API. Um, okay, I just realized that I'm not sharing my screen. <laughs> but yeah, somewhere in the somewhere in the Fugu tracker, you can click a link there to check at the document to, to check um, the documentation for, I mean, the specification for that API. And from there, you can see um, the status of that spec. So if it's still in the public draft or it's already a candidate recommendation. So web Bluetooth, it's still not yet in candidate recommendation. Um, it, it depends per API, but right now, uh, I'm not sure specifically which API is like near, is in is in like candidate recommendation level already, but um, maybe as a general thing, the APIs that were like started many years ago already, they have higher chance of becoming standardized first. Um, so yeah, just check on Fugu Tracker that web that app. Um, check the specification from there, and you'll see you'll see what what at which stage of the process um, that API is um, already so I don't know it that the top of my head <laughs> all right thank you so much sir Ragnell so to answer that question it is mostly all of them to be standardized so um thank you sir Ragnell so we will have our short um photo off but just smile in the camera and our tech team will come screen <laughs> On three, two, one, smile. All right. Thank you so much, Sir Arnel. And Thank you. We will see you soon. Thank you.